My name is Cedric Roberts, and I have a very creepy encounter to tell you about. My wife Darlene Roberts and I were invited to a celebration party hosted by my old college buddy Carter. We were great friends in college, but with time, we had drifted apart a bit, so I had not personally heard much about him. I knew that he was running a successful business. He had a restaurant of his own, which was quite popular, and just recently, due to a lot of success in his previous venture, Carter had opened a second restaurant in Manhattan, and he wanted to celebrate another milestone of his successful journey with his newest establishment. At the time, my wife and I were living in Jacksonville, Florida, and we were very excited to be a part of Carter's new venture celebration. Connecting with an old friend again was going to be great, we thought. So my wife and I flew out to this extravagant party that he was hosting at this old mansion high up on the hill. Carter had come across a historical hotel that was high up on a hill in a small lake town with a very small population of 2,000 people. It was a very good place for the event. It provided great views and sceneries surrounding the mansion, and the mansion itself, of course, was magnificent, a thing of timeless beauty. We pulled up to the party in our old BMW that we had brought along, and we were really surprised by the Ferrari, Rolls Royce, and Mercedes parked in front of the old mansion. The valet took our car, and we entered the event. Carter was right there at the reception, ready to greet all his guests to the party. He greeted us with a big smile and complaints for our being late. We were one of the last guests to arrive. We offered an excuse, our cause being the delay in getting our car out to the airport. The waiters, however, were very different in their reception of us. They greeted us with cocktails and champagne. After the reception, we had officially become part of the event. The party was a black and white attire, and believe me, there must have been over a hundred people at the party already. And then came the hellos and how do you do's to the old friends and acquaintances that were common between us two friends. But some new introductions were also in order. Carter introduced us to the many people he had come across in his various ventures these past few years that we had not had the honor to meet yet. It was an interesting experience, to say the least. There were all sorts of people gathered at the party, from every walk of life. Talking to some of them was enlightening. The most noteworthy event of the night happened when Carter introduced us to his partner Herbert in this business venture. The guy was really well-dressed and had an air of class and grace about him. He also had a heavy British accent, hinting that he was not really from around here. Everything about him screamed well. He looked and behaved like the old-timey aristocrat, and our assumptions about him proved to be right when we came to know that he was the one who owned the mansion we were standing in. And not just that magnificent castle. Herbert had the ownership of hundreds of properties throughout all of Europe and even some in upstate New York. It was mind-boggling to just think of the amount of wealth that single man had in his name. And what was even more pressing was the question of how Carter had come across him in the first place. So, to quench the curiosity I had in me bubbling endlessly, I asked Carter about his encounter with Herbert. Carter explained to us how his business had been going down rapidly and how he had suffered some huge losses one after the other. He had lost most of his investment. In fact, according to him, it had gotten so bad that he was damn near to declaring bankruptcy. Things had gotten so bleak he was about to give up on his business. And just when he had lost all hope, he had come across Herbert. 
It was an accidental chance encounter at a restaurant on a fateful day. One thing led to another, and they began talking, and then planning. Herbert was looking to expand on his business ventures, and listening to Carter talk about his own failing business had given Herbert the idea of a joint venture between them. They decided to become business partners. Herbert invested in Carter's restaurant. Carter gave it all his time and effort, and soon his hard work was brought into fruition. Now the restaurant they had opened together had become very successful, so much so it had even been listed in the top 20 best restaurants of New York articles of various magazines. Their new restaurant pulled in very high numbers constantly. Carter would not stop gushing about the success he had and how his hard work had brought him to that position. He proudly kept telling us about how popular the restaurant actually was, and it had only just opened. So many people had wanted to come to their restaurant that they had already made a two-week waiting list for the guests in just the second week of the restaurant opening. Carter and Herbert were both so ecstatic about the success that they had gotten from this and so sure of their future ventures that they explained to us how they were thinking of opening a four-star retreat hotel just north of the city and how they had already chosen the location for it. They just had to go get some permits to go forward with the plans. Hearing Carter talk about all of this so excitedly was no doubt a very good sight to see. I was happy for him achieving his dream of being a successful businessman, and I wanted nothing but the best for him. But something just did not sit right with me. Herbert was a very powerful and wealthy man on the surface. At first glance, he seemed very open and even down to earth in his behavior. But I could never understand how Carter exactly came across a man of so much wealth so randomly, and that too when he had hit rock bottom, and that was exactly what he was looking for. And what were the odds that that man was willing to put out that kind of trust in a total stranger? It all just seemed too much of a coincidence, too good to be true. But I did not want to appear as someone who was questioning Carter and his success so I kept shut about my reservations and just focused on enjoying the party for the time being. We made small talk with Herbert and other guests at the party, had some pretty fancy drinks and a lavish food assortment. All in all, it was a good party, and we had ended on a good note. We said our goodbyes and see you laters, and headed back to our home. Now that we had reconnected again, we often got in touch with each other, Carter and I. A few weeks after the party, Carter told me another exciting bit of news of his. Their hotel adventure had actually just been approved throughout the state. They were going to get much bigger. And bigger they did get. Just a year after their project was approved, they had made a name for themselves throughout the state. Carter had built up so much trust with his investment partner Herbert that the word had spread throughout New York City. Everyone knew about their restaurants and hotel and everyone was talking about it. They were just as curious about that unlikely partnership as I had once been and how that puzzling connection had brought about such enormous success. It had become an inspirational story everywhere. Around that time, Carter reached out to us again, this time for another one of their hotel's grand openings. He had successfully pulled off another winning move and had gotten another financial gain added to his portfolio. He was famous in his circle now, beyond famous, practically a legend by now. So to celebrate another milestone in his professional spectrum, he invited us out for a small getaway vacation at his hotel. Darlene and I were free during this time, so we decided to take him up on that offer of his. We were also curious to see all the happenings going on around that place. So we packed up and took off to the hotel for a nice stay. We were supposed to be there for three nights, and we were really looking forward to it. 
When we finally reached our destination, it was a sight to behold, as it should have been. It was a $30 million hotel designed with a historical vintage look in mind. And that money showed in the way that it was a thing of elegance and old world charm. It screamed high society. Further adding to its beauty was a $2 million garden surrounded by an 80 foot long man-made lake. It was an amazing place to spend our many vacation. But our mood was a bit dampened when we came across some of the many stories circulating the area. The place had been seeing some disturbances for a while. Local residences of the town had been reporting animal mutilations in the area. And on another concerning note, random passing visitors had started coming up missing. The stories about the missing people never seemed to leave the area, but were kept strictly under wraps. How? No idea. I thought it was the influence and the money that kept their mouth shut, but all that was really becoming a cause of concern. The residents of the town were a bit subdued and not very talkative. But when the town people started talking once, they spilled all the beans, even if they seemed terrified telling us all that. Over the past year, the locals and even the sheriff had started being treated as prisoners in their own town. They did not seem very happy about it, but could not even do anything to change their situation. The success of the endeavor had gotten so big that even Hollywood was starting to take notice of the place. Many celebrities had been frequently spotted leaving or hanging around the hotel. It had become a hot zone for the actors, models, and paparazzi alike. So seeing some faces we were a fan of was an added bonus for visiting such a nice place. But I still could not shake the unease I had started feeling when I had first met Carter's investor. I had stayed quiet then. But this time, this time, I was going to ask questions. And ask away, I did. I asked all the burning questions I had, shared all the reservations that popped in my head. And as an answer to all my inquiries, Carter gave me a mysterious smirk. It creeped me out even more. And then he walked me into this hidden room behind a painting on the wall. The room opened up to us, revealing what I could only assume was a torture chamber of some sorts. I had never seen anything this horrifying before. There were chains hanging from the walls, spotted red here and there. The only furniture there were some plain iron tables, and those tables were covered in red fluid too. Blood, it seemed. And just when I thought I had seen the worst of it all, I saw an actual woman tied to the wall with those said chains. She was totally unconscious, hanging loose with her hands tied. I turned my horror-stricken face to Carter, ready to ask some shit. He was ahead of me, and even without asking, began explaining to me how Herbert was not who everyone thought he was. He was wealthy, yes, but he was a very dangerous and powerful man. In fact, maybe he should not even be called a man. He was a vampire. A centuries old dead, but not really dead entity. I could not believe my ears. Surely Carter was joking. Surely he was just pulling my leg. Surely it was all but just a nightmare. Carter seemed unaware of the inner turmoil I was going through, seeing a woman chained to a wall waiting for her inevitable death. It was a terrible thing to come to terms with. But Carter kept on talking as if I was not seconds away from peeing my pants in fear. What I got from Carter in my shock-addled mind was that every night Carter would find a lone human as a sacrifice for Herbert in exchange for his financial backing. He would prepare the victims as Herbert would wake from his sleep and hunger. Just as I thought I was getting to the point where I could process it. Finally, my breath was knocked out of me again. Herbert 
walked out of the shadows and just snatched up the poor unconscious woman that was chained to the wall. He started by ripping her arms from the chains, and the next thing I saw, he had ripped his throat open. I felt the cold burst of air passing me by as Herbert started feeding off her bloody body. A shudder ran through me. I looked over his shoulder at the mirror behind me. There was no reflection in the mirror whatsoever. I could feel my stomach churning, and I had to bite my tongue in order to stop myself from retching out loud. I did not want his attention on me, but the effort felt futile, because as soon as he was done with the woman, Herbert looked right at me. He walked over to me, his face and front fully covered in blood. I felt frozen in fear, unable to move a single muscle. He stopped right in front of me, and with a bloody smirk on his face, he grabbed me by the throat. He picked me up from the floor like I weighed nothing. I could feel my whole life flashing before my eyes. He let out a chuckle, no doubt amused by my pitiful state, and brought me even closer. And then, I heard a whisper in my ears. Nobody saw anything here tonight. Right, Cedric. I did not feel like it was a question at all. I hadn't been able to have a good night's sleep since the night it happened. It had been two days and my mind was still stuck on the events of that night. Every time I closed my eyes, I would see that woman being devoured alive and hear her screams when she had gained consciousness halfway through her death sentence. Sometimes, I would almost convince myself that it was a dream, almost being the key word, but I couldn't. I could not chalk it up as my imagination, because I could still feel Herbert's hands around my throat as he had picked me up right off the floor. I would still shudder, just thinking about it. What was worse was that I was still staying with them. I knew what was going on in that place, yet I still found it in me to stay put. I didn't want them to come after me if I left in fear. Herbert had let me go that night after Carter had assured him of my silence, but he would surely not let that go if I just ran away. He would come after me to finish me off, so I felt like I was in a very tough spot. My wife had started noticing that something was up with me. She was trying to give me space so I could tell her, but... I knew it was just a matter of time before her patience ran out, and I was proven correct. She had cornered me on the last night of our trip, urging me to come out with the secret that was eating me up, according to her, and I had never been the one who could keep any secrets from her. So I caved, telling her everything that I conspired. She was equally shocked and horrified. We had a thorough discussion about what to do next, and the only logical answer to that was, kill Herbert. Darlene and I followed Carter to the secret room that night. We knew it might be our death sentence, but we could not let any more people lose their lives to this monster. We were going to free today's victim and finish off Herbert with wooden stakes we made, but things did not go as we planned. After hitting Carter on the head, we moved to untie a man held by chains. That took time, and in that time, Carter had started to wake up. So we just left him there, taking the man, and ran out of there. Now our best option was to leave the mansion and come back some other time to go through with our plan. We needed to hurry, but the unconscious man was slowing us down, so we decided to hide in one of the rooms. We made a stop in our room to get our things. We were getting out of there when things took a turn for the worse. Carter had caught up with us, with crazed eyes and a large knife in his hand, trying to plunge it into my chest. I ripped his ear off with the same knife and saw two bite marks on his neck. He had been turned. I kicked him off of me and stabbed him repeatedly with the wooden stake in his chest. Just then, Herbert joined the fray, grabbing me from behind and throwing me across the room. He walked over to me, showing his bloody fangs that must have pierced Carter. 
He simply whipped his hand and the large table I was hiding behind just flew into the wall, revealing his true power to me. I was terrified. I could feel it by my heartbeat in my throat. I tried to scramble away from him, but his hand was once again around my neck. He lifted his arm up slowly as I felt my body rushing up the 12-foot wall. At this point, I started to feel defeated, completely hopeless and on Herbert's mercy. I felt resigned to the fact that my death was coming to me right then and there by his power. Just then, my wife emerged as my savior as she struck him from behind, beating him repeatedly with an aluminum bat. It wasn't really damaging to him, but it did cause a distraction. I felt myself drop from the wall, banging up my leg as I came down on it wrong, twisting in the process. He swiped my wife off of him, throwing her into the cabinets against the wall. Just before he got the chance to turn back towards me, I stabbed the wooden stake through his chest. We both fell to the floor, and I climbed on top of him and began stabbing him repeatedly. I felt the magnetic energy escaping from his body as the wooden stake disappeared from my hand, along with his body, right before my eyes. And I was alone, left only with my own bloody hands in front. There was just black smoke and ash where his body had once been. <laughs>